In this video, I'm going to be going through a mid-course review for preliminary or Year 11 HSC Engineering Studies. So this is the uh, exam done after about eight weeks or so of study from the senior course. Uh, it's worth noting that these days the assessment will be only less than an hour um, because of new assessment requirements. The, I've already recorded this. I initially had the first couple of questions. I had the microphone further away and um, I'm re-recording this so that to save people's ears um, so they don't turn it up and then get blasted at the five questions in. Uh, because I've already recorded this, I think say so this is a pretty reasonable exam. I think there's some interesting questions. There's a couple where I had to think just to make sure, but I, I don't want to uh, overthink any of the questions. Um, there's... I like it because there's not a whole lot of electrical stuff, which is uh, what this would this would be a good pr um, paper to look at before you go through the 2014 paper from the same author. I think that that's probably a better test, um, although the electric electrical stuff uh, I don't like um, I, just because I don't teach it before the exam and or before the review. And the 2014 has some vector stuff, which I almost certainly test. It has some moment stuff, which is unlikely to be in the test I'm writing for this particular year, but otherwise uh, stuff that you probably should look at. Um, there's some of the questions that are uh, doubled up, so that's why I think this is a good test to look at first. So I'll go on to question one. So when we combine two, element, two or more elements chemically in a fixed ratio, that is called a compound. Uh, the mass of 45 kilograms under uh, uh, gravity, assuming that we're in Earth, is, well, for, uh, on Earth, gravity is 9.8 meters per second per second, or 9.8 meters squared. Some people say 9.81, it's fair, or 9.806. Um, we're it allowed in engineering just to use 10 as our, um, our value for gravity. So we can take 45, multiply by 10, gives 450 newtons. Now for question two, that's for, for pretty reasonable. If I was writing this question, I would write 45, 450, 450 kilonewtons, and then 4,500 uh, 4, kilonewtons. That's what I would do to try and trick you. Um, or 450 kilonewtons. It's worth noting that when we write the word newton, um, my understanding is you're supposed to write newton with a lowercase n, and the symbol, if you just write 450 space capital N, because Newton's is named after a human, but we need to, when we write out the whole word, we want to differentiate between the human and the the unit. And just because nobody wants to be wrong on the internet, um, I've confirmed yet. So the Newton lowercase n, the symbol is a capital N. Uh, no one is ever going to take a mark off for you for that. I'd been teaching for several years before I, I started noticing that, and I've now started changing my notes a little bit. Um, so yeah, capital N when it's just the symbol, it's probably easier just to tell students to always write capital N because you're less likely to make a mistake where it matters. Macroscopic means that you can see with the naked eye. Microscopic means you need a microscope. Strength, hardness, toughness, and ductility are all examples of mechanical properties. I, in my notes, just refer to these as other properties because I'm not all that interested in chemical, thermal, and physical properties. Chemical properties are things like res um, uh, resistance to corrosion or um, resistance to UV light, like degradation due to UV light. Uh, thermal properties are how much the thing expands and conduct uh, contracts under heat, and also the ability to conduct electricity. Uh, sorry, to conduct um, to conduct heat. And physical properties are typically we talk about density, which is how heavy the object is per cubic centimeter, and porosity, which we really only talk about porosity, say, for instance, with soil engineering, uh, not something that's covered in this course at all. They actually give you the answer further down the paper, which is a strategy you can use to, um, to improve your marks, which is to, if you see something written further down the paper, you're allowed to go back and change your answers. Um, I think this is where I'm up to before I stop recording. I was... Uh, yeah, thermal properties, usually we're talking about ex thermal expansion. Physical properties, usually we're talking about density and porosity. Density is just how heavy the object is per cubic centimeter, something like that. The force of 4,500 newtons is the same as 4.5 kilonewtons. Uh, engineering quantities have both magnitude and direction are called vectors. Oh, yeah. 
The ability for a material to return to its original shape after deformation is called elasticity. Plasticity is when it holds its shape. Malleability and ductility are both forms of plasticity. Which of the following is a third angle projection? Well, in Australia, we use third angle projection. That means the top view on top, and we use target, then flag. So it's target, then flag. So it's either A or B. How do we remember which flag it is? Well, this one, for starters, doesn't look like much of a flag, but how do we know if the flag is going left or right? I always think of it as being a less than sign. Yeah, it helps me to remember that if I think of it as less than sign, that helps me to remember. Okay, question nine. Metal alloys that contain large quantities of iron are called ferrous metals. That's a good question. I didn't put it in this year's um, paper, but um, I'm definitely thinking about putting it in future papers. A chemical bond which involves the transfer of electrons between atoms is called... The transfer of electrons between atoms is a good question. Is ionic bond? Um, that's a good question. Covalent bonds share uh, electrons. And in metallic bonds, we have positively charged ions surrounded by a, um, a cloud or a sea of, uh, of electrons. Uh, delocalized electrons, they often talk about. Um, okay, so question 11. An increase in carbon content in steel in results in... Um, an increase in hardness and brittleness sounds pretty good. Again, just in the interest of not being wrong on the internet, um, I thought, seeing as I'm editing this video anyway, in the first version of this video, I went on to talk about how it can be easy to second guess yourself uh, as a teacher to think, can I say definitively that adding carbon doesn't improve corrosion resistance? And it might. Um, I mean, I just did a quick Google search as well and... I don't think it does. Um, like I think I can say definitively it doesn't. But what we can say is we want to go for the most correct answer. And uh, in Chapter 3 of the preliminary course, when we're doing braking systems, we have this graph which shows that as we increase the carbon content from 0 to 1.4, we can see our hardness goes up all the way. And our brittleness, we're going to measure brittleness um, as a function of notch toughness. We can see that the notch toughness goes down. And it's going down to the point where at 0 0.9, it's not even on the graph anymore. The idea is it's so brittle at that point, it effectively doesn't have, um, it, it doesn't have much toughness at all. So we can see that as carbon content increases, we can see that hard, hardness increases and toughness decreases. Uh, brittleness, we can say, is uh, it will be pretty proportional to, to that. Um, it's interesting to note that t um, strength, tensile strength, peaks at the eutectoid at about 0.83% um, carbon, though that's a little bit beyond what we typically have done by the time we're doing uh, this test only eight weeks into the course, so we're not going to worry too much about that. Okay, density, shape, and uh, color, and texture are all examples of physical properties. We'd already talked about density. I talked about porosity. Porosity is um, how many, how much holes there, there is in things. That's particularly important for clay, right? For soils, we talk about uh, porosity. Uh, not something we cover in this course at all. Ductility is the property that determines the abilities, um, materials ability to. Normally, we talk about being hammered into sheets, but yeah, we see the word hammering. I I personally like to use the def the definition definition of deformed under compression which forces ten, uh, forces which stretch are tend to be referred to as tensile forces I do talk about this very very briefly I showed you a picture along with my Bridgerton uh, gif of her saying that love is the most powerful force of all um, okay question 15 but I generally don't talk about that very much at this stage uh, it's I do mention that Tensile um, and tens tension forces, tensile forces and compressive forces are both axial forces. For the moment, we don't need to worry too much about that, but we're gonna, um, we will talk about that later, especially when we talk about trusses. Okay, a mega newton is equal to something times 10 to the next six uh, newtons. Mega means 10 to the six, um, or million. Uh, Again, capitalization, but we're going to let that go. Okay, question 16, uh, areas of engineering practice. The en engineering is a discipline acquiring scientific, mathematical, economic, social, practical knowledge in order to design structures, machines, devices to lead improvements to the lives of people. Identify four different fields of engineering. Well, I can just turn my head and I can see mechanical, civil, ITEE. -E. So ITEE is information, telecommunications, um, 
sorry, information technology and electronics engineers. Uh, it can also be telecommunications. I don't actually, funnily enough, in my picture, I don't actually have IT, what, what it stands for. Uh, we have electrical, biomedical, environmental, and chemical. They're the major um, colleges recognized by Engineers Australia. Uh, describe the type of work that would be done by an engineer in, in one of these fields. Uh, I will let one of the students pick. Um, Luke, you were the one who, who contacted me about running this study session, so go ahead. Okay, so mechanical engineers work with dynamic forces. I'm stressing that because in a previous uh, HS, uh, previous test, I think last year's test, I asked what they do. So they work with forces that are moving. So uh, mechanical engineers design, um, construct, and uh, would design, produce, and maintain uh, plant and equipment. So when I talk about that, they may, they uh, design and main, uh, design, produce, and maintain. Uh, moving objects, usually machinery or um, large large moving objects. So this could be anything from a factory that produces ballpoint pens or lunch boxes, right? They're build it's funny to think that sponges are designed by mechanical engineers, right? Sponges don't have any moving parts, but the machine that makes the sponge does. Um, or on the up the highest end is the International Space Station, most expensive thing ever built, more than a billion dollars. Um, that would be built by mechanical engineers. Cruise liners are pretty damn expensive. They're built by um, mechanical engineers. Specifically, they would be the subdiscipline of nautical engineers. Um, aerospace is the uh, the mechanical engineers most dedicated to things like um, ISS, uh, the, the International Space Station. Mechanical engineers can also be involved in mining. Way more than three marks, right? What would I say? I would try and work with a design, produce, and maintain um, plant and equipment is the best answer for for, for first sentence. Beyond that f first sentence, you can then say, then from that, I would try and have one sentence for each of those. So they design these objects based on estimated forces. They produce machines that make regular household objects or they are involved in the construction of cars and other large equipment. They maintain, uh, mechanical engineers can be involved in the maintenance of these, this, these machines. For instance, um, the maintenance of a mine. That would be a very, very strong three marks, right? Uh, that would be potentially a four marks, but we don't give four marks, so we've just got to move on. Okay, so I like these questions. Anyone who's looked at my papers will see that I've done this before. So force, the symbol, I don't know what they're going here with symbol. So uh, F is, I guess they're saying the symbol for force. I don't like that, but I'm going to accept it. Uh, we're going to move on. I guess it's a bit of a clue. Um, so let's go force is force. It's measured in Newtons. The abbreviation is N, uh, capital N. That should be lowercase n. Energy, E, Joule. The abbreviation is just J. It's named after a human, so it's a capital J for the symbol. Um, Power is measured in watts. I don't really talk about this too much um, until we talk about power in greater detail. We I talk about it very briefly in chapter three of um, year eleven, but then we talk. We just um, in chapter two, which I've just done before the half yearly, um, we talk about power a lot with uh, year twelves. So I always talk about um, I, I play the who's on first video and I say what is the unit for power, and then when people say what, I said yeah, it wasn't a question. It was a statement. What is the unit for power? Right, but um, it's very funny. Everyone laughs. Pressure. The SI unit is pascals, right? And um, dun, 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 dun. this is a tough one. What's the symbol for? Pa what's the unit for pascals? Capital P, little a, right? So it's a two-letter abbreviation. Two, two-letter abbreviation. Mass. The unit is kilograms. So I like the style of this question. Um, I think that we can do better than that. And I try um, I try to, I often include this sort of question and I try to make it fairly difficult. Um, I will say that you should know all the SI units, even though I don't go into, um, I normally focus on the seven base, I, of the seven base, base SI units. I mainly talk about kilograms, meters, and seconds. It's worth noting that liters measure um, volume the same as meters cube measure volume but only the meter cube is the SI unit. Litre is a non-SI unit metric unit, right? So it is metric, but it's not SI. 
Um, there are seven SI units. You might remember the something about Mary, not six, seven. Of those seven, I can only think of four off the top of my head. Right, so aside from kilogram meters and second, KMS, they're the three main, the ones that we focus on all the time. What's, what's an extra one? Kelvin, what's Kelvin measure? Excellent. So, ten, so degrees centigrade is a metric unit, but not an SI unit. Yep. Um, okay, so that's a question I've asked. Particularly, I like to ask that question to year nines. Uh, d briefly describe the term force. Okay, a lot of people will just write force equals mass times acceleration. I'll pay that. The other two, uh, I, problem I find is that that can be a bit of a cycle because it just keeps coming back around and around. Can, can, you, define, can you define it without using those terms? The term that uh, most dictionaries will use is a push or pull. I like to chuck in push, pull, or twist. I think that's a um, that that's a little bit more um, a more inclusive um, answer. I don't love that answer, but I can accept it, right? So it's uh, because sometimes it can be a bit of an abstract concept. So, for instance, thermal expansion is an internal push, right? The forces it forces are pushing, is separating. It's all a bit confusing. Um, also, I've talked very very briefly um, in I think that same Bridgerton uh, post on Facebook about the four fundamental forces. Um, so the four fundamental forces are electromagnetism, uh, gravity, the strong force and the weak force. We never talk about the strong force or the weak force in this subject. Um, you should be familiar with electromagnetism and gravity. That's as much as I'm going to say about this here. So let's move on. Okay, the diagram shows uh, two pulley wheels that are used to drive a drill press. Uh, given the diameter of both these pulleys, calculate how many times the follower will, will rotate if the driver rotates 10 times. It wants you to know that circumference equals pi times diameter. Now, we haven't discussed this in our course. We do talk about efficiency and we talk about mechanical advantage and calculating velocity ratios. And I guess in a very abstract way, we could say, well, we've talked about velocity ratio. We've talked about what is the distance traveled by the load and what is the distance traveled by the effort. In this case, we can just say that if the driver is going to turn around 10 times, well, so let's say for if we think of it as um, the, the diameters is the same as counting teeth, right? It's the same idea. What we can say is that when this has gone around 100 and um, 100, millimeter, 100 millimeters, this will have turned around once, but this won't have turned around a full time yet. Yeah? So now, when it's gone around, the, so the little one will only have turned, turned around once, but this won't have gone around full time. By the time this has gone turned around twice, the little wheel have turned around three times. So from that, I can say that if this one's turning, if the driver is rotating 10, I think the follower should be rotating 15. That would be the answer I write here. Um, uh, okay, but not a question you're going to get in. Um, I, I doubt that I will ever have a mid-course review question that talks about something like that. Define the following mechanical properties. Geez, they're giving the answer, so as long as you could go back to the multiple choice, you could go back and say, oh, hey, they gave us the answer. Hardness is the ability to withstand scratching, indentation, and abrasion. I also talk about the ability to withstand wear. When we say the ability to withstand wear, that's the same as saying the resistance to abrasion. Toughness is the resistance to impact. A toughness is a measure of how much energy an object can absorb before it fails. Um, toughness is quite a difficult one to, uh, to I think, to describe. But I, if I just talk about impact, um, impact resistance, I find that's a good definition of toughness. Toughness is uh, the difference that I always use the example of a phone. My daughter, when she got her first mobile phone, she had dropped it on the concrete literally within 24 hours of receiving the phone. Um, scratching... Right when you take your keys and it scratches the screen, that's the resistance to scratching is hardness. The ability to be dropped without shattering is is toughness. Um, typically, as hardness increases, toughness goes down, and vice versa. Typically, not always. Typically, malleability is the ability to um, be permanently deformed in compression. So plastic deformation, um, the ability to be hammered into sheets. If someone wrote that, I'd always pay that as correct. Now, Copeland in the textbook, he defines strength as the ability to withstand loads. I will pay that because Copeland says it. But strength is, in actual fact, the ability to withstand stresses. And strength is measured in um, megapascals. Toughness doesn't have a unit. Hardness is measured um, 
It's measured empirically using uh, a, a whole bunch of different tests. We have four hardness tests that we refer to typically. That machine there that I'm pointing to is a Rockwell hardness tester. Rockwell hardness is the default that we typically use. Okay, um, when materials are placed under load, they can deform elastically or plastically. Outline the difference between plastic deformation and elastic deformation. I really like this question. Um, I'm inclined to use this uh, to steal this question um, in the future. The idea is plastic deformation means it hold its, holds its shape. So um, I always like the example of a metal ruler. I think that most people have had some experience with a metal ruler by the time they get to year 11. And the idea that you can take a metal ruler and you can put it on the edge of a table and you can spring it, go doing, 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 doing. But if your friend goes and takes your metal ruler and they lean on it, they're going to bend it. And now that ruler is never the same, right? That's the difference between elastic deformation is when you're treating the ruler like a spring and plastic deformation is when you lean on the ruler and you bend it out of shape. Yeah. Um, uh, that, that would be... That's a long answer for two marks. The short version is um, plastic deformation. The object stays in its final, it stays in that shape. Elastic deformation returns to its original shape. A good example of this is a spring that can be stretched out. Um, chemical bonding ha can have a significant impact on the property of materials. Explain in terms of chemical bonding why polymers have lower melting points than metals or cer and ceramics. Okay, so it says why they generally have lower melting points than melting metals and ceramics. I'm going to say that if they'd said thermosoftening polymers, I would feel this was a better question, but we're going to run with it because um, we, we're not even going to talk about it any more than that. We'll just say that. Uh, that thermosofting polymers are often amorphous. They have no regular crystal structure. Rather, they have long chains of um, or uh, their long chains uh, uh, of they consist of long chains of I just I don't want to say polymers again. You well, they are long chains of monomers, but the, each of those chains is a polymer, right? Long polymer chains. Boom. There we go. I, I'm changing the the adjective and the noun. Uh, long polymer chains, and they are free to slip past one another. Thermosetting, now this is me adding to the question, right? Didn't ask for this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Thermosetting polymers have crosslinks between these polymer chains, which means that the polymer chains are not free to slide past each other and therefore don't, um, don't easily melt under, um, un under temperature. Okay, explain in terms of chemical bonding why metals are good conductors while ceramics and, and electric, uh, some ceramics are electrical insulators. This is a great question. Um, so, because metals have free, they are surrounded by a cloud of free electrons. Those electrons are able to um, to conduct both electricity and heat, right? But they didn't even ask about heat. We're just going to focus on they are, um, they're free to conduct electricity, whereas um, ceramics typically are made of covalent and ionic bonds, and they don't have any free electrons. They're held um, the ions. This is me adding additional information, right? You wouldn't, know, wouldn't need to write this. But the ions in ionic bonds can carry charge. However, they are not free to move in their lattice and therefore can't conduct electricity. Um, yeah, that would be the answer we're going to give there. I think it's a really good question. Polymers can be divided into two classifications, thermoplastics and thermosets. Explain the difference between thermoplastics and thermosets. I kind of did this above. So we'll say that thermoplastics are made of long polymer chains and they're free to move, uh, they're able to move freely when heated, um, be allowing the, the polymer to soften. Thermosets, on the other hand, have crosslinks, 3D crosslinks between these polymer chains and therefore are not able to move freely when heated. Okay, this photograph shows the inside panel of a refrigerator. The door has been manufactured through a process called vacuum forming. Describe the process of vacuum forming. We talked very briefly about vacuum forming, not enough to justify three marks. Um, so we showed a video. The idea is that you, first of all, you need to have a mold, right? Step one, you need to produce a mold. Step two, you take a thin sheet of polymer, 
you heat it, heat it up to the point where it will soften easily. You place the sheet of, um, of hot soft polymer over the mold and then a vacuum is produced drawing the thin polymer sheet onto the mold. Um, I'm okay with the fact that we don't talk more about um, vacuum forming. I'm pretty sure I showed you a very short video of the process. You could say a picture is worth a thousand words. Me, I'm far more likely to ask you about injection molding than say um, vacuum forming. But vacuum forming and blow molding are in the top three of the, um, the, the kinds of manufacturing processes we might ask you about. Okay, the photograph below shows a crisper drawer from a refrigerator. It's been manufactured by a process called injection molding. Describe the injection molding process. Love this question. Okay, so um, hoppers, uh, sorry, sorry, not hoppers. Um, did they say if it's thermoset? It is slightly different if we're using thermosoffing or thermosetting, but for th we'll, we'll just go run with assume it's a thermosetting polymer, uh, sorry, thermosofting polymer, and we'll say that granules are fed into a hopper. They're then pushed through a screw, a, a heated screw, and allow um, where they melt until sufficient melt builds up at the front of the screw. The melt is then injected into a mold, and then that is allowed to cool. And then it is the uh, the the cool once the the uh, the mold is set, it is then injected. I have um, I've given you in your notes a good three mark answer. Um, okay, identify a property. Identify one property of polymers and explain why this makes polymers suitable for these parts. For one probably polymers and explain why this makes polymer a suitable choice for these parts. Oh, um, okay, so three marks. Okay, so for these parts, for talking about both of these parts, well, for both of these parts, if they're talking about both the door and the tray, the answer I would give there is I would say that they can be um, very easily manufactured. Right, polymers are incredibly easy to make, especially through processes like injection molding and vacuum forming. Um, so, property easy to manufacture. That would be the most uh, definitely the property I would go to first. However, there's plenty of other properties we can talk about. Um, corrosion resistant. So, um, a fridge is a an environment that is often exposed to moisture, and as a result, we can't use materials that would rot. Or, um, or corrode in that environment. Plastics tend to not corrode. Uh, well, sorry, plastics tend to, plastics are non-corrosive. Therefore, they make um, good a good choice for these materials. You could also talk about so strength. You're not allowed to say strong. You can't say plastics are strong, but you can say plastics have high tensile strength. Therefore, they will be um, able to withstand the loads or the stresses that are exposed to them. For example, a bottle of milk when the door um, when the door is slammed shut. Um, that that's broken certainly parts of my fridge. Um, you could talk about hardness. You could say that um, refrigerators typically have a long a long service life. They have a lot of objects that are um, slid in and out th through the through the um, through the materials, so they need to have sufficient hardness to not to not uh, wear due to abrasion. You could talk about toughness and toughness that um, occasionally objects are dropped. On fridges, and they need to have sufficient hardness to not um, to not fail when uh, with those impacts. Pretty much, this is pretty broad. As long as you describe the property, you're going to get away with with a lot here. Transparency is another answer you can give, right? Just the fact that you can see through the drawer is useful, so that, that way you can see what's uh, what's in the inside. Um, now, you might say that polymers are not particularly hard; they're not particularly tough. That's true, but they're sufficiently hard; they're sufficiently tough. They're certainly harder and tougher than a sheet of paper would be. And although we don't typically use sheets of paper or cardboard, I mean, some, no one's going to make a refrigerator out of cardboard. Um, you could also talk about um, therm uh, uh, thermal insulating, that they have reasonably, uh, they, they're poor conductors of heat, 
which is also very important for fridges. That's heaps of answers. I've talked about this already in my 2014 paper review, so you can go for more information there. Okay, this steel section below has been processed, uh, been produced through a process of rolling. Describe the process of rolling to produce a shape such as this. I really like talking about rolling, um, but what we could say is there's hot and cold rolling, so we could describe hot rolling, but they haven't asked for that. We'll just say that a metal blank is passed through um, high strength rollers. The high strength rollers deform the shape, um, producing, produ producing the desired profile. I don't know if, I, if that's fully three marks. I'm unlikely to ask you to define rolling at this stage. I would be much better feeling, feel much more comfortable if I asked, say, um, compare hot and cold rolling in year 12. I think it's a much more reasonable question. Um, I would be happier if this was worth two marks. I'd be interested to see, um, I, I know the guy who wrote this paper, I'd be interested to see what he would say. What, what, what is he looking for for that third mark? Um, I guess you could say that the section is cut to length. Yep, because they can be rolled, they might be rolled at six meter lengths. They'll then um, subsequently be cut to the desired length. Um, f final machining could be applied to um, reduce sharp edges where necessary or things like drilling holes where needed. Right, So that, that's another factor. Um, okay, the machine component illustrated has been manufactured by a process called casting. Describe, describe the process of casting metals. Okay, for one mark, describe casting. I would say metals are heated up to the point where they become molten and they are poured into a mold and allowed to cool. In the case of sand casting, well, well they, they didn't tell us it's sand casting. I mean, really, beyond that, in, I have got a whole a video, it's one hour, I'm very proud of my casting video. It's one of the videos I'm most proud of. Um, it has all of the content for both year 11 and 12. There's so much to talk about with casting, right? It's an hour-long video, but if you ask for describe the process of casting, I think that's that's all I'm looking for. Heat the metal up until it's molten, pour it into a mold, allow the mold to, uh, the mold to cool, remove the object, and any finishing uh, uh, um, finishing machine to finish the object. So, for instance, like flashing and risers might be removed. There we go. That's a third mark. We haven't talked about this this much effort, so something we could in maybe a future time I might talk about that in greater detail, but. Unlikely to give you a mark for three marks. So I'd be more inclined to give you a one mark and just expect you to say all of that for one mark. Um, or a lot of that for one mark. Metal components in metal fabrication can be joined through a variety of methods. Compare and contrast um, mechanical fasteners such as nuts, bolts, and rivets. I call that cold joining, but that's a good, a good terminology, mechanical fasteners, compared to metallurgical methods such as welding. Well, um, compare them. Welding is typically stronger than um, than mechanical fasteners. Also, welding provides um, greater rigidity. So pin, um, nuts produce a pinned joint, which still allows some movement. Um, welding requires a lot of expertise. Um, so you need specially trained staff, uh, 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 yeah, uh, specially trained staff. Whereas mechanical falseners can be um, can be just specially trained stuff is, is better. Um, we don't need to, to go on further than that. It's also really important when you're writing with paper, you know, to not waffle. Right, say what you need to say and be concise. It's harder for me because I'm not actually writing these. I'm just saying answers. It's very easy for me to waffle because I'm not actually seeing those words appear on the page. Um, but nevertheless, try and be mindful of that. Remember, they're looking for two marks. So if I just say degree of difficulty, boom, that's that's one mark, right? If you just wrote welding is more difficult, that's one mark, I'll give you that. If you say welding is typically stronger, boom, I'll give you that mark. Do I need to see the word typically? No, I'll pay it. Even if it's typically true, I'll still pay it. So I would I would give all both marks there for four words. Okay, then finally we have the toaster. I hope it's finally. Um, I do, finally it is the toaster. Uh, I have done a whole video on the toaster. Um, you can. It's one of my earliest videos. Go check that out. Uh, so, 
that is all I'm going to do for this paper. Maybe you want to check out the 2014 because I went through that one in a lot more detail. Interesting to note here that there was no real vector addition, um, which is interesting. Uh, I would definitely rather do a vector addition question than that, that um, velocity ratio question. Uh, otherwise, is there anything else I really notice? No, it's a reasonable test. Okay.